Hello, and welcome to week one, lecture three. In Biblical Hermeneutics, Bible 2223. In this lecture, we will continue on our topic of grammatical, historical, inductive study and look at specific areas related to researching the historical context as well as some of the general rules of, for hermeneutics. Inductive study focuses on observing what is within the text and behind the text and then drawing conclusions based on those observations. In this lecture, we will turn our attention to the historical cultural context study. Historical cultural context study is necessary for determining a proper understanding of the biblical text. Looking at the audience is an excellent example. Who were they? What was their culture? We recognize that biblical passages not only express a writer's train of thought, but they are also reflecting a way of life. You will find the more you look at some of these passages that there are quite a bit of the social realities, political realities, and religious traditions within the text for us to find and read. A correct interpretation is consistent with that historical, cultural background of the passage. That goes back to the golden rule of hermeneutics. A text cannot mean today what it did not mean to the original biblical audience. Therefore, I need to know what it meant to them. The principle that I extract from the text should be consistent with what they would have seen, heard, and understood. With that, when I am looking at their historical cultural background, I want to discover what their perspective. When we need to be able to comprehend how those communicators approach this topic that is being discussed within the text. We need to be ready to understand as much as possible, as much as we can extract, as much as we can go to for other helpful sources in order to pull out that information. Some great places will offer this type of information needed. Bible dictionaries are a wonderful place to go. Sometimes this is one of my first approaches. If not, if it is something that I'm not very familiar with, or there are a couple of words that are in the text that I'm not familiar with, a Bible dictionary is usually a great starting point. You can look up a city name. You can look up a person's name. If you're reading about the bronze serpent and you're unfamiliar with that concept, most of the time, a, a Bible dictionary will have the kind of, that kind of information that you're looking for, or it will at least give you other places to look or maybe some ideas for some other sources. Another place to consider is a Bible atlas. But not all Bible atlases are the same. You have some atlases that are just that, a group of maps. That might help you, but there are other Bible atlases that are unfortunately using different, they use the same name, but they, they give you different uh, information, such as looking at specific time periods. So you can look up, for example, 200 BC, and it'll give you the marital customs, housings for Israel, Egypt, Mesopotamia, food restrictions, and different things. So all of these things that were different types of information, uh, different types of, uh, of information that's going on in society at that time, could be listed according to date. That's a wonderful resource sometimes to go to. Also, if you're looking at a commentary, typically the first few chapters will be a background about the author and the church or community to which the letter is being written to. That is another source to consider. You can use commentaries for Old Testament passages and New Testament passages. Some of the others that I like are the big survey books. Again, that is just a good background and one that could be used a lot. Again, depending on the book, you could try to pull from a variety of sources. Try to pull from a conservative, fundamental Christian um, author. Um, you could also try to pull from a theologically liberal source that's going to stretch you and make sure that you're, you're, you're right. Maybe you're being too conservative with something, uh, and the text is, is from a different – addressing the text from an entirely different perspective could help you reconsider your rationale or maybe even strengthen your resolve. You could also try to pull a Jewish um, source. Um, find a Jewish scholar, how, how they approach that passage, just to get a Jewish point of view about the, the passage of Scripture you're looking at. So there are different source options out there. <clears throat> Perspective will help us see their mindset. So looking at the historical cultural context, it grows out of what was the original audience's worldview. What were some of the emotions and what were some of the things that they were reacting to? Was it a time when it was a highlight for the Jewish faith? 
things are going well and they're close to God and so they're receiving blessing and protection? Or was it one of those darker time periods when they are being persecuted? Maybe they're feeling that darkness of separation from God. What was the mindset or perhaps what was the worldview of this community when it's experiencing the events that the text is describing or maybe it being addressed to them? So what's, that's, all, that's also going to help us understand where they are coming from. What is the mindset of the original audience? When Jesus calls Herod Antipas a fox in Luke chapter 13, verse 32, what was he thinking when he said something like that? Was he saying that Herod was witty? Is Herod good looking? Is that a derogatory term? What was the mindset when he makes that statement? So those are some of the things to look at when we're in that arena. Foxes are unclean. Herod the king is un unfit to lead. It was not a compliment. Um, it was pretty much a derogatory term. So perhaps this could also be a, a, a reference to Esau? Maybe. Contextualizing biblical truth means that we have a set of bifocals, if you will. We have one in which we are looking at the context of where that resides and who that audience was and what are some principles that they would have understood. The second lens is how can I take that principle and apply it to my modern audience? What is it about this that is going to go to both generations and both cultures? That is what I'm seeking to do. I'm looking for some kind of principle that applies not only to the original audience, but also to myself. How do we do that? First, we look at the original historical background and we understand each passage consistent with its historical background. First and foremost, what the original audience understood. With that, when I understand what the original audience understood, then that is what is going to have a large bearing on what I am able to understand. Another popular passage that you may or may not be familiar with is Revelation chapter 3, when the church of Laodicea is re being referred to, and there is mentioned that they are neither hot nor cold. And because they are neither, there is verse 15. I wish that you would be one or the other because you are neither one or the other, and I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. So <clears throat> how are some of the ways that you might have heard this expressed? Is it a beverage? As Christians, you should not be hot or cold. I'm sorry, you should be hot or cold. We should not or do not be mediocre Christians, lukewarm. Do not be mediocre or do not be lukewarm. Lukewarm Christians, God will spit out of his mouth because they are mediocre. So be hot, be passionate about seeking God. That's probably what most of us have heard. What is interesting, though, if you go on and do a cultural background study of Laodicea, you will find Laodicea is situated between two other cities. You have Colossae, which is known for its cold springs, and Her Heropolis, that is known for its hot springs. As water was being funneled through Laodicea from these two cities, the mineral mixtures between the hot springs and the cold springs were coming together in Laodicea and making a very putrid, emetic odor. So what is being described there in Laodicea? I wish you were either hot or cold. Hot is great. We like a hot bath. We like hot cocoa when it's cold. I do not want hot cocoa after I've mowed the lawn. I want cold water. I like cold water. So hot has some good properties and cold has some good properties. What was happening in Laodicea was that this lukewarm putrid mixture was giving off an anemic gag reflex inducing smell. Imagine that imagery that is happening for Laodicea when they hear your spiritual climate is vomit inducing to God and, and you smell that smell that you smell that makes you that gag reflex come up. That's how God sees you. Imagine the impact that that would have had on the original audience. They could be thinking, I am a medic. I am putrid in God's sight. Now, what I think is unfortunate sometimes is that we go a step further and we say that we should not be a lukewarm Christian because the text says, I wish you were hot or cold. Can you support that in any other biblical text where God says, I would rather you be adamantly opposing to, of, of me, be cold uh, rather than to be lukewarm or somewhere in the middle? Is it better to be passionate than lukewarm in our relationship to God? Yes. Is it wrong to interpret hot and cold as polemical statements from God? Yes. 
This helps us to find a correct expression. We need to recognize that we have a language barrier between the biblical cultures and us. Many of us do not know or understand Greek and Hebrew. English sometimes cannot convey how they would have understood the impact of words. So we might need to play with the way it is said in English. Maybe it needs to be expressed differently because it does not have the same impact that it would have had to the original audience. We must express biblical truth in our language in ways that most closely correspond to the ideas of the biblical culture. So perhaps altering an expression to gain a grasp of the impact that a text would have, would have had so that the principle was still conveyed in that expression would be good. And, and what they would have responded to and what, they, what perspective they would have grasped it from, that really should be the intention. But how do we do that? Well, how do we retrieve the historical cultural background? We look at the background of a biblical book. We look at the specific passage in which the book is found. So again, Bible dictionaries, atlases, commentaries, those are all often good sources to go back to. That will normally give you a general kind of a broad view or in background information about the people group and the culture. What is going on in Jerusalem at the time? What world power is dominant? Those types of things will usually come out. When you're studying a particular passage, we look at the book first. For instance, if I am studying First and Second Kings, I have the background information of the books as a whole, but there are particular stories in First and Second Kings that may be slightly different because each of those kings had slightly different political and religious agendas. So a political passage may be slightly different than the book as a whole. Before studying a particular bit, biblical passage, we should become familiar with the historical cultural background of the book in which it occurs. First of all, I look at the book, and second, I look at the passage specifically. I ask the questions, who was the author? Was there perhaps an editor of this book? So we look at the identity and characteristics of that. Was it an apostle or a prophet? What was this person's relationship to the community as a whole? Where it is possible, know the recipients, their characteristics, their circumstances, and their community, their social norms. What you want to watch for, if it's the Old Testament, for example, are they inside or outside the promised land? That is often an important component to the story. Another is gender issues. How are women treated? Oftentimes in the Old Testament, women were treated like property. It is what it is. They had no rights. Their only function was to give their husbands sons. If she could not do that, then she was a disposable product. You, do not li you don't have to like it nor do we have to agree with it. But that is the way that it was. You even see that a little in the New Testament. There are many things written about women. They were second-class citizens, per se, but because they were not as well educated, they were restricted in many ways. Therefore, because of that lack of education, they did not always have the same rights as men. When considering social norms that are there within the text, some cultures were more esteemed than others. For instance, the Samaritans were very, they were looked down upon, and they were shunned. We see this operate between the Jews and Gentiles in the New Testament. You hear Romans and Paul's emphasis on the importance of being a citizen in Rome. So these are some of the social norms within the text that we need to be familiar with. Next, you need to look at the date. When was the text written? This is going to help us with some of the historical information. That is why in the Old Testament, there are several important dates to memorize. By memorizing these dates, it can help you shorten your work because you already have an idea of what is happening religiously and politically in Israel. Same thing with the New Testament. Is this before or after 70 AD when Rome destroys Jerusalem? Specifically, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed in 70 AD. Those are some great things that you need to have in the back of your mind when you're looking at dates for a particular text. Consider making yourself a list or a chart of important biblical dates to keep in your Bible as you look at the cultural background of the book. It is important to discover the historical cultural background of a biblical book because that provides the initial framework for understanding specific passages within that book. Individual passages may or may not have special historical features. So you may know something very general about the book, but there may be something very specific mentioned in your passage that you need to be familiar with. So for instance, if you're reading in Amos chapter 10, where he is talking about the calf idols of Bashan, 
What is that? You may be familiar with the cultural background of Amos, but that particular passage, you might need to do more work with it. Another example um, is in Matthew chapter 23, where we read that uh, Jesus is talking about Philocrates. And you can look in the New Testament for Philocrates, and there's nothing there for Philocrates. And, and you need to go all the way back to Leviticus before you find a place where Philocrates are defined a little bit better. So sometimes there is something within a particular passage that needs further uh, definition, further clarification. Something that a broad background of the book is not really going to provide you. So in conclusion, we, we, we really discovered how historical cultural context studies give the interpreter the stage upon which the biblical text can take place. Without this critical work, a proper and right understanding and interpretation of a biblical passage is made much more difficult to attain.